Come home to Jesus. This is the message that Max Solbrecken has proclaimed for 50 years to multitudes across the world. His crusades have taken him to the Hindus of India, Muslims of Pakistan, Buddhists of Sri Lanka, voodoo worshippers of Haiti, Catholics of Malta, and headhunters of northern Luzon. He has preached God's Word in stadiums, churches, tents, universities, and prisons. He comes to you today with the message of God's love and power. The man who is not afraid to preach the truth, Pastor Max Solbrecken. Let's all stand, shall we? And I want to read from St. Luke's Gospel. St. Luke chapter 4. Reading as follows in Jesus' name. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had found the book, when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Shall we bow, please, for prayer. Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I pray now that you will bless each person that has come to this service this morning. Bless those who could not come and on beds of sickness or other problems. Bless these precious men who have come to minister to you and to bless us with their singing. Bless their families. Watch over them all, I pray. Anoint thy servant now that I may speak as the oracles of God. Bless all those who hear this on the YouTube somewhere across the world. Meet the need of each one. We pray for Christ's sake and for God's glory with much thanksgiving. And in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, please. And he came to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up. Jesus returned to Nazareth after he'd been baptized in water and filled with the Spirit. After the Holy Spirit had fallen upon him, he returned to his hometown. And as his custom was, he made a custom of being in the synagogue. I wish more and more people had a custom where they would be in church Sunday morning. I wish more and more people would have a custom where they would pray for the food and thank God. I wish more and more people had the custom of of, of talking to their neighbors about Jesus, being kind and good and compassionate. As his custom was, he stood up for to read. He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel. Only the anointed preaching of the gospel changes people's lives. The anointing of the Holy Spirit. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Oh, how many brokenhearted people there are. How many broken people there are. So many people that are broken hearted. To preach deliverance to the captives. Captives of the devil. Captives of evil things in this world. And the recovery of sight to the blind. To set at liberty in the bruised. And to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, the acceptable year of the Lord was what they would call the day of Jubilee. Every 50 years, those who had made a lot of mistakes, people who were in jail were freed. 
people who had sold some of their heritage could buy it back. The year of Jubilee. And the year of Jubilee that Jesus Christ is speaking about is the gospel age. That's the year of Jubilee, the acceptable year of the Lord. The acceptable year of the Lord began when Christ came and ends when he returns. It's in the book of Isaiah 61. And he read, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Moffat says in his interpretation, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He hath anointed me to preach the good news, to tell the prisoners they are free. To tell the captives they are released. The good news of the gospel is to tell the prisoners they are free. The captives, they are released. That's what it is. Now let's go back to Luke again. And let me have a look at a little bit here. The poor in spirit. He preached, came to preach the gospel. He was anointed by the Holy Spirit to preach the gospel, the good news, to those who are poor. Poor in spirit, poor in everything else. There's a lot of rich people who are poor. A lot of people who have a lot, you know, this girl's goods, but they are poor in spirit. He came to help the downtrodden and the poor in spirit and in body and in whatever. Because there's a lot of poor people around. Came to heal the brokenhearted, wounded, nervous breakdowns. In 1970, in the old Edmonton Revival Center, I had been having crusades all over the world, and I was in Newfoundland, and we had 7,000 people in our crusade there, and God spoke to me and said, go to Edmonton, start a church. We bought the old Tivoli ballroom. I said, the old Tivoli got converted. <laughs> and we had that Tivoli ballroom. It was the Edmonton Revival Center in one night. And we had a lot of people converted. They came in. I mean, they were being converted by, by the hundreds just for the first five years, you, you couldn't stop it. It was so great, the revival. An old Dutchman came in and from Dutch Reformed Church. I've forgotten his name now. But he was totally, almost totally deaf. And God instantly healed his ears. He could hear, that old Dutchman. And he had a neighbor whose name was Rene Woodstra. He said, Rene, you've got to come to the church. You could be healed. He said there are miracles happening. People are being healed. Now, Rene Wootstra had come from Holland. He had been through the war over there, and he was a very, very fragile guy. He was having nervous breakdowns all the time. He had been in the mental hospital for months, and now he had come out. He saw a psychiatrist every week for five years. He was like a vegetable. He would sit there and look out the window and you would walk by him and he never saw you. And this old Dutchman, his neighbor said, you ought to go. You ought to go. He's telling Rene and Henny. Henny was the wife and Rene and Henny, Woodstra. And he said, you should go. There are healings. And all of a sudden, he came alive. Healing. First time he spoke for a long time. I'll go. So they brought him. That night, God healed him totally, completely. And he came back home, and his wife couldn't believe it. He took all the medicine and threw, threw it in the toilet. 
She said, you're crazy. But that was in 1970. He became one of the great men in gardening and in the University of Alberta for years, teaching, you know, horticulturalism. Today, you know, he still does people's yards and perfectly well. There was no hope for him. All he could remember was the plays he heard, you know, in the Second World War, the horrible way the Germans treated the Dutch. Jesus came for him. And he came for so many people that are sick. We were in the Nordic Center over there preaching and just started in the ministry. It was about 19, I guess it was about 19... 63, and, and we were in this Nordic Center in New Westminster, British Columbia. And one night, a pastor, Jensen, Pastor Jensen, Jensen, came with a man from the, took him from the mental hospital and brought him. He was originally from Germany, and he was really, really mentally ill for a long time. And they brought him and I laid my hands upon him and I said, in the name of Jesus, every evil spirit must leave. He seemed to come alive. And they brought him back and the psychiatrist said, what in the world's happened to this man? He said, Pastor Jensen took me to the Max Holberg Crusade. Well, he said, Pastor Jensen, take him again. (laughs) He took him again. God delivered that man. And for years and years, he ran the Goodwill store over there in Skid Row in Vancouver. Just died recently. Jesus came for a person like him. He came for the broken hearted. He came for the nervous, tormented people. It says he came for the captives, to set the captives free, free from sin, oppression, hatred, demon power. Lynn Kipchenko was here last Sunday morning. I had not seen her for years. Lynn Kipchenko in 1971, Her aunt had come to our services and God had saved her aunt. They weren't Christian people. They didn't go into any church. Walter didn't. She didn't. They had no religious background at all. But she had been molested as a girl. She couldn't get over it. Lynn Kipchanko, she just couldn't get over the fact that she had been molested as a young girl. Molested. She became an alcoholic. She was married, and I think they had a couple of small kids, and Walter was a bus driver in Edmonton. And she planned to kill herself because she had nothing to live for. She felt that her husband and children were better better off without her. But her aunt, her aunt came And her aunt said, you ought to come with me to church, to the Edmund Revival Center. I got saved. She said, get the H out of here. And she began to curse and swear and tell her aunt where to go. in Different languages. And her aunt just sat sitting there quietly, taking it all. She said, I was so evil. I was so mean. And finally, my aunt said, it's okay. But Lynn, if you want to come, Pastor Max Solberg in his preaching tonight told her where the place was. And she said, she just said, God bless you, and she left. She thought to herself, why was my wife so, or my aunt uh, so quiet and didn't fight? Because <laughs> they were a fighting family. <laughs> she said, maybe I should go. 
Then she thought to herself, yeah, I will go. And if this doesn't help me, I will take my life. She came in, the place was filled with people. She didn't see her aunt, she knew nobody there. And when I got up to preach, she said, you said I had come prepared with a special message, but just now God's changed my message. And I'm going to preach, and I'm going to ask some questions and answer the questions. And I'm going to share a message entitled, What if you've done all these things? Is there still hope for you? She said, I, everything she'd ever done, I mentioned it. And I gave the answer from God's word how that Jesus Christ can deliver from all these things. And she said, I went to the altar. I'd never been to a church like this. And she said, I just right at the altar, crying and weeping and weeping and weeping and weeping. And I wanted to say, God, I'm sorry, but I couldn't speak. I couldn't even talk. She said, when most people had left, you walked up to me and said, even if you can't talk, God knows what you're saying. <laughs> she became a tremendous person in our church. Walter got converted, the whole family. But she said she and a friend of hers, Audrey, Audrey used to go to a restaurant where they had a nice meal, but there was a teacup reader. And the teacup reader would always come then to people who wanted a cup of bread. It was a great place for tea. She said she had gone twice, and the teacup reader had told her many things about herself. She was thinking, maybe this teacup reader could tell me my future. And they'd gone, and then after she had been converted, they went to that place because Audrey wanted to have her meal, and they went there. And she said that uh, there was not a person there. The place was empty. So she said, the teacup reader came over and said, I may as well sit with you. And I, uh, well, Audrey said, I'm having my meal. It's okay. But uh, Lynn was only having tea. So she said, I was so full of God, I began to tell the teacup reader what happened to me. She said, I got saved. You can't believe it. I just feel wonderful. And she was talking about Jesus. like, And the teacup reader just said, oh, yeah, okay, that was good. And, you know, it didn't bother her. When she was finished reading or drinking her tea, the teacup reader says, I'll read your cup first. Sure, no problem. And all of a sudden, she looked into my cup, she said, and she screamed, no, no, no. I can't read it. And uh, Lynn said, come on, you could, of course you read it. Go ahead and read it. She jumped to her feet and she put her hands on her face and screamed. She said, no, I can't read it. I don't have the, any power. And then she said, what, what kind of power do you have? And then she said, this, all this God this stuff has taken away my power. And she screamed and ran out of the room. She never went back to take up readers after that. Captives. The bruise. Guilt. The terrible guilt. The condemnation. In Romans chapter 8 verses 1 to 2. It tells us about the fact that when you're in Christ. There's no longer any condemnation. St. Paul writing. Here was a man who had been a murderer. St. Paul, Saul of Tarshish. He was a Jewish terrorist, a Jewish enforcer. He was there and held the clothing of the people who threw the stones that killed Stephen, the first martyr. 
He was on his way to Damascus to go to the synagogue and kidnap people. He had people with him. Bring them back to Jerusalem to beat them and force them to turn back or be stoned. He's on his way with an entourage of kidnappers. And all of a sudden, a bright light comes, brighter than the sun. And he's thrown down upon the ground, and he's lying there in the dirt. He hears a voice, Saul, 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 why persecutest thou me? He said, who art thou, Lord? I am Jesus, Yeshua. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. He said, what do you want me to do? The two greatest questions you could ever ask God. Really, who are you, Lord? I want to know who you are. Are you really Jesus, are you really the Son of God? Did you really die for me? Did you really rise from the dead? Are you God the Son from eternity? Was incarnated. True God from eternity. True man. By the virgin birth. Are you? Are you really? Yes. And then, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Who are you, Lord? And what do you want me to do? When you ask those questions, he'll tell you. He'll tell you. He'll tell you. Precious Jesus. In the book of Romans, the eighth chapter, there is therefore now no condemnation. No condemnation. So many people are condemned. Since they did years and years ago, the devil comes and he condemns. He's a liar. The devil's a liar. When he comes to you, tell him where to go. He has no business. Because if you are forgiven, you are forgiven. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Romans chapter 5, verse number 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, peace with God. Oh, the peace that he gives. Let me go to Hebrews, the ninth chapter. It says here, Hebrews chapter 9. Let's go back to verse number 11. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and of calves, but by his own blood, Jesus entered in once into the holy place. He carried his own blood into heaven where it is now. Pleading for us, the blood of Jesus Christ is alive. The blood of Christ lives. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctify to the purifying of the flesh, purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot, Purge your conscience. Purge your conscience. I was in Quebec City, 1974. I went, I had been to Montreal, but I went to Quebec City, and we were in this little building, a little, little auditorium, and some tremendous things happened. A man who had been injured and he couldn't walk up straight. He walked like so. He was instantly healed and straightened up. And he climbed up on a grand piano, a tall one, and jumped down on the floor to prove his back was good. <laughs> a man walked up to me and he said, Reverend, 
I've never seen anything like this before. You must come back. I said, no, I'm not coming back. 99% Roman Catholic. I don't know any ministers here. French, I'm not coming back. He said, wait, I own six discotheques. I'll give you one discotheque. See, 600, if you'll come back. I said, no, I don't know anybody here. He said, you don't need to know anybody. I know everyone that needs to be known. I said, okay. He said, the place will be filled. So I went. I was amazed. The place was packed out. We gave out a thousand New Testaments in French from the Gideons. The Gideons gave me a thousand. <laughs> a thousand New Testaments. After the service, I was sitting in the back. I had learned how to drink tea in India. Over there, they say, don't drink cold things. If you're hot, drink something hot. It'll cool you down. So I learned from India, tea, tea, chai, chai. So I'm sitting in the back, cooling down, drinking tea. <laughs> My interpreter comes in. My interpreter's husband, Pastor Max, says, a woman wants to see you. And everyone's left. They're all gone. I said, I'll be with you in a few minutes. So I got my things. I walked out. Here's this young lady about 30 years of age. A beautiful woman, but she had cried so hard. Her eyes were almost shut. She had an eight-year-old girl standing beside her. Beautiful eight-year-old girl. Long, blonde, golden hair. I said, you wanted to see me? And she said, I must talk with you. She said, I have three things I have to tell you, and I must ask you. I said, wait, I'm not a Roman Catholic priest. I'm not a confessor. She said, no, no, I've got to talk to you. I know you're a man of God. I said, okay. She said, I couldn't go to an ordinary priest, but I, I understand you're a man of God. I said, okay. She said, I hate my dad. When I was just 13 years old, my father molested me. And for five years, my father molested me sexually until I ran away. And I hate my dad. I said, if you want to get to heaven, you must forgive him. As evil as he was and is, whatever he's done, you must forgive him if you want to go to heaven. Can you forgive him? She says, I think so, yes, yes. She said, my husband is in jail. You know, the French people like to drink. And he said, at a great big party, all these relatives, and they got drunk. And this one man picked up a butcher knife in his drunken state and plowed it into his brother's heart and killed his brother. He said, my husband is a good man. He was drunk. He didn't know what he was doing. How long is he in for? Well, he's been there three years. He has five to go. Can you wait for him? She said, yeah, yes, I love him. I'll wait for him. And then she began to cry. And she said, when my husband went to prison, I was pregnant with a little girl. But she said, I, I couldn't trust my dad. And my husband was in prison. And I was crying all the time. Crying all the time. When my baby was born, born with colic. And my baby cried day and night. And one day, I don't know what happened. I don't know what came over me. But when I came to myself, my hand was over my little girl's mouth. And my baby was dead. That baby was dead. Is there any hope for me? I felt cold chills go up and down my spine. I have six children of my own. I love children. I thought, how could she do it? I said, what shall I answer her? God said to me, if there's no hope for her, close your Bible. Go back to Eden and stop preaching. It was for people like this that I sent my son. 
and I burst into tears. And my interpreter was there, and her husband and their children, they came, and we all hugged. I said, there's hope for you. There's hope for you. There's hope for you. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot, purge your conscience? Only the blood of Christ can purge the conscience. I've counseled hundreds of people. There are psychiatrists and psychologists. They, can't, they counsel, but they can't not get rid of that sin. They can't remove that guilt. Only the blood of Christ removes the guilt. I said, there's hope. There's hope. She burst into tears. She fell down and kissed my feet. I lifted her up, held her. We stood there and cried for about 10 minutes. She and my interpreter and her husband and three children. And all of a sudden she went, <sighs> and she was, she grabbed me. She was baptizing my shirt with tears. I let her go. And then she said, she opened her purse. And she said, I want you to see something. And she opened her purse. Three bottles of pills. I had been to the drugstore to buy these to go home and kill myself. But I was in that drugstore. I saw the Quebec Journal. And there it was. And I was on the front page. Man of God comes to Quebec tonight. Will he do miracles? They'd given the whole front page to my, all my, from my magazine. The man who all the desk attacks, he knew everybody. She said, I saw this. And I said, if he's a man of God, I won't take this until I ask him, is there any hope for me? She said, you've saved my life. Saved my soul through Jesus Christ. And my little girl still have a, a mother, a husband, have a wife, and I've got a boy five years old in a little place for those who are mentally challenged. He came to heal those who are bruised. Jesus Christ came, healed conscience, broken bodies. I'll just close in a few minutes, broken bodies. Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thy iniquities. Heal in all thy diseases. He's promised to heal the sick and the suffering. Psalm 103, Martin Luther came home from some preaching. And he found his, he found Philip Melanchthon dying. Philip Melanchthon was his great theologian in the revival, if the, in the great, great move of God. And he was unconscious, lying there. And Martin Luther took his sack, his whatever he had that when he was riding or he threw it against the door. In Norwegian, He threw his bag against the door and locked the door. Why? To keep people out and to keep God in. God, you're not leaving. He said, you're not leaving till I talk with you. And for one hour, he literally hurled the promise of God into the ears of God. For an entire hour, he cried to God for 60 minutes. Every scripture. He said, you're not leaving, God. You're not leaving until you answer me. I've got to have Philip Melanchthon. Or the Reformation will be finished. You must. And all of a sudden he heard, Luther, 
Luther, stop praying. He was awake. Let me die. Luther says, you shall not die. If you die, I excommunicate you. He said, nurse, bring some broth. So the nurse brought, Luther, I don't want any broth. I want to die. Luther said, if you die before me, I excommunicate you. He outlived Luther. <laughs> Can you say hallelujah? Hallelujah. Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all that iniquities. Who healeth all thy diseases. Who redeemeth thy life from destruction. Who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. Who satisfieth thy mouth with good things. So thy youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord execute righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, who forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. That's the word of God. It's the word of God. A couple more scriptures. Isaiah 53. He says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteem, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. We're healed. Our sicknesses, he's taken them from us. Our pains, our pains, he has taken upon himself. Precious Jesus, the eighth chapter of Matthew. And it's verse number 16 and 17. Here it is. When the evil was come, they brought on him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast all the spirits of his word and healed all that were sick. They might be fulfilled which are spoken by the say of the prophet, saying, Himself took our infirmities. And bear our sicknesses. And in First Peter, it also confirms it. First Peter, the second chapter of First Peter, this great man of God. First Peter two and verse number twenty four. Two and twenty four. Who his own self bear our sins in his body on the tree that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. By your stripes you were healed. Praise God. I was in Littleton, New Brunswick preaching in the Pentecostal church there, 1994. And they told me about a young man, a Baptist boy, who had had a terrible accident, Terry Summers. And he had such pain that he could not come to the meeting. He was a total disability. He'd been working in the mines he had fallen off a platform onto his back and wrecked his back. And they operated on him and they cut the nerves. And he had pain day and night. For 17 years, he prayed that he could die. He was from the Baptist church. He believed in Christ. He was a born-again believer. They prayed and prayed. Nothing happened. His daughter had fallen in love with the son of a Pentecostal deacon. And so she heard about our meetings. He didn't come 
And I was there the first time, but I returned again in the fall. And he had promised that if I were to come back, he would come to the meeting. And I knew the bishop there from Newfoundland. And so I came. And the power of God was so strong. The last night of the meeting, he did come. But he couldn't sit in the church because he had to stand or walk around or he would paralyze in his legs. So he sat in the chair just outside in the foyer. And when I had made the altar call, prayed for the people who wanted to get saved, I was going to pray for the sick. They brought him. And I sat him on a chair because he has this pain standing anyway. I took his two feet in my hands and I just, one of his back was so out of place that one of his legs kind of went way, way back. And I just prayed a simple prayer. Jesus, whatever you did, in years gone by, do it again. Jesus, this man suffers. He prays every day that he could die. His wife would say, don't pray that, that way. I don't want you to die. He said, I can't live. He was on so many painkillers. It was almost a walking drugstore. And I said, dear Lord, in your great compassion, come now. According to your word. And in the name of Jesus, grant a miracle. And all of a sudden, his foot jumped out and he screamed, it's gone. He jumped off his chair and he began to jump up and down. Just went wild, danced around. He said, the pains are gone. The pains are gone. The pains are gone. There was an eight-year-old girl standing there. Now, he couldn't lift ten, more than 10 pounds. He said, pick her up. He picked her up and danced all over with her. I said, pick me up. 190 pounds. Danced me. I said, pick up A.W., 245. Danced around with him. Went back to the doctor. The greatest specialist there in New Brunswick said, this man believes that he was healed by a miracle of God, and so do I. He put that twice in his thing. Recommending him, take him off all the money they will be getting. He wants to work. Terry Summers. He called me, This sent me an email. It's been 25 years, he said. I haven't taken a pill or had a pain in 25 years. All about Jesus. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit, be and abide with each one until Jesus comes. The Lord bless thee, keep thee. The Lord touch thee, heal, strengthen, prosper, protect, bless. In Jesus' name, amen. For 50 years, Pastor Max Solbrecken has awakened the conscience of his audiences through the anointed proclamation of the claims of Christ who said, no man can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and mammon. The truth is you are either for him or against him. You cannot remain neutral. Great costs are involved in spreading of Christ's gospel. Please consider investing in this ministry. Contact Max Solbrecken at MSWM, Box 44220, RPO, Garside, Edmonton, Alberta, T5V1N6, Canada. You have been watching the Come Home to Jesus television ministry with Canada's preacher man, Dr. Max Solbrecken, who has proclaimed the word of God across the world for 50 years without fear or favor of man or devil. Ask for Canada's revival magazine, The Cry of His Coming, when you write. Invest in souls by supporting this end time ministry. Please contact Max Solbrecken at MSWM Box 44220, RPO Garside, Edmonton, Alberta, T5V1N6, Canada. Oh, die again.